member of the Pastel Society of America, among many others, Richard McKinley has been a working artist for 35 years. Richard's work is represented in several national galleries, and he has more than 30 years of teaching experience. He's a frequent contributor to the Pastel Journal, and his work has been featured in several Northlight books, including A Painter's Guide to Design and Composition, Painting with Pastels, and Pure Color, The Best of Pastel. Richard's new book, Pastel Pointers, compiled from his blog for the Pastel Journal, will be released by Northlight Books in fall 2010. Richard divides his time between plein air painting and locations he loves, reinterpreting those paintings back in the studio, and instructing workshops. For more information about Richard, visit his website, mckinleystudio.com. In this video workshop, Richard will show you how different underpainting techniques can set up a pastel painting for exciting responses, challenging you to open the door to possibility and serendipity. Hi, I'm Richard McKinley, and I've been working in pastel for more years than I would like to uh, uh, share with you, but over the 30 years that I've been working in it, one of the concepts and one of the techniques that's been an integral part of my own work is underpainting. So today I'd like to really discuss how important the underpainting has been to me in my work. It's really my dance partner in the painting. So as we approach the underpainting and we get into that process, the most important thing to keep in mind, and you've got to keep this in mind, is that it's a setup. It's a setup for what you want to do with the product. We're pastel artists. We're applying pastel. We're staying in the pastel mindset. What we're doing is we're setting ourselves up for what we anticipate that we want to do with the pastel. Now, sometimes the underpainting can provide a lot of the finished product, and you're going to see that. I mean. You know, sometimes it could be the majority of the painting, but, or we can end up covering the whole thing up. That's the nice part. We never know, and we've got that option, though. And we can do that with pastel. We can just cover up whatever's there. So what I have here are some examples. This is a concept around a scene that I'm very familiar with, one of my favorite scenes in Bend, Oregon. I've painted there a lot. It's a really beautiful scene. And what I've done in this stage is just basically work through the concept of what's the format that I think I would like to paint it in. Any one might work, but in the moment, which one do you feel the most comfortable is conveying your concept? Then I've gone through a value study, just a simple what's called no tan or value relationship sketch around the scene so I can see the big masses and have an idea of that before I jump into detail, which can be the curse of a good finished painting. And then here's just a quick little color study that's fairly localized to the scene, representational of the way the scene was. We'll get much more experimentative as the painting goes. That's the fun of painting. We're not photographers, we're painters. What I have here are a couple finished underpaintings that represent this scene put into action. They're both on Wallace paper, so there's a consistency in this case of surface. It's museum grade white Wallace paper, so I get a lot of illumination coming back through. This was done with watercolor, and you can see the effect of watercolor is one that tends to give us larger blooms and drips and splashes. It has its nature, its personality. This is actually done with thin washes of oil paint, which is an option on many of the surfaces that we work on as pastel artists. You need to check that out, but the option is there. So very, very thin washes of oil paint like tea creates a much finer web-based underpainting. Now the real foundation of this setup, as it is in anything in painting, is the theory of simultaneous contrast. That theory, which applies to how we see and respond to things, is the foundation of the setup. And with it, it lays the groundwork for everything and every choice that you end up making as a painter. So let's discuss simultaneous contrast and the theory that's behind it. It, of course, it's been around forever, but as science and as uh, uh, artists have used it, we've gained more of an understanding of what's really going on with it. And what it really comes down to, let me simplify it because it's an intimidating term to say simultaneous contrast. It really just means that nothing is what it is until it has a relationship. That everything that exists really within our consciousness has to have a relationship and everything within our painting. That's what we're doing. We're creating our own little universe within our painting and everything within it has to have a relationship. 
So let me explain that a little farther. You know, I'm fairly tall. I'm, when I was younger, I was 6'3", and I'm probably a little bit shorter now, but that's still fairly tall. But if I get on a bus with a professional basketball team, I appear short. So the, my appearance changes, but I didn't change. And that's what goes on in our painting often. That's why maybe one choice you made in one painting worked so brilliantly, and you go to do it or repeat it again in another painting, and all of a sudden, it's not working. And you're confused as to why. So when I fell into an understanding of this, it really helped give me a tool to use in setting myself up in my painting, applying it in the underpainting, and then utilizing it towards the end of the painting as a means of solving those issues that come up. Now here's a couple examples over here that'll make the point, I think. What I've done here in this large chart is we see a value scale. And as you look at this, and I look at this, and just, just observe it, don't look for some big mysterious thing right now. Just look at this value chart for a minute. And as we look at it, pretend that this was some element in the painting that you were about to paint. You're getting ready to paint this scene. Maybe there's a, a road, or there happens to be a pole if it was a vertical, uh, or a tree trunk or something. And as I went to paint this, it would be very easy visually to decide that, and I'm with you, I see something darker and I see something lighter. But when we challenge that thought by taking a similar value scale, and I take that same value scale, and I wrap it around so that now I see it in a different relationship, what I notice when I bring it around and I pull those two pieces together is that actually that center strip, which appears very different when it's isolated, becomes visually back to what it truly is in reality, it's the same value. And so it is on the big chart over here. What we see here to us appears lighter, I mean darker, excuse me, darker against this segment and lighter against this segment. It didn't change, its relationship changed. So this is the key. And value is such an important element in our paintings that let's look at it this way. What is a highlight in one area is a shadow in another area. That's food for thought, and that's something to dwell on the rest of your life when you're painting. We use those terms, highlight, shadow, we throw them out there, but what do they mean? Until we set a relationship, it doesn't exist. Once it has that relationship, what's a shadow in one place becomes a highlight in the other. Now, how is this affected in color? Color is a little more subtle. And color can be a little harder to see and sometimes understand. It takes a, a, a little more observation. But what we can see in this chart down here is simultaneous contrast being applied to color. If we look at this for a period of time, and again, not try to look for something too profound, but something subtle, when we look at the two gray squares and we look at them for a time and we say, is there, is there a difference between the two? I'm going to set some tendencies here if, if you may not be seeing it. This should appear slightly warmer, and this should appear slightly cooler. Now there's another little phenomenon that happens in the warm and cool game now. The warm one may appear to come forward so that the rectangle looks like it's sitting on top of the blue, and in this case, it looks more like a hole that the red is actually on top of it. That's actually aerial perspective, and we'll briefly discuss that a little further on in the game. But what we notice with color is that it's affected, again, by its relationship. You've got to trust me, this is exactly the same gray, the same gray, but when applied to something very warm, it appears cooler, and when applied to something very cold, it appears warmer. It didn't change, its relationship changed. So color is doing the same thing that value is doing. It's affected by the opposite of what it's next to. When it's a next to something light, it became darker, remember? And when it's against something cool, it becomes warmer. When it's against something warm, it becomes cooler. So every color is being shifted. What was the perfect blue in one painting for you for the sky may not be the perfect blue in another. So this is going to have a big effect in what we do in our pastel paintings and in the choices of what we do in selecting the things for our underpaintings that we're about to do. It's not an arbitrary accident. It can all be thought about and back to 
setting ourselves up for what it is we want to do on top. I can use this information as a means of setting myself up. Now let's just apply a few pastel strokes to a surface. This is just a, a scrap piece of Wallace paper. What I've done here is left one piece, somewhat the white of the paper. I've made one section as dark as I could without filling the tooth of the paper. In this case, I just used some diluted India ink for the example. And then I stained this with some burnt sienna watercolor and here with a, a rich blue, probably a cerulean or maybe a phthalo based blue. I can't remember for sure, but it's a bright blue. So that I can somewhat duplicate what was happening over here with a few pastel sticks. So let's see if there's a little change in the appearance of things. I'm just going to pick up a, a gray, kind of a warm, nice gray. When I see it down here in my palette box, I notice that it's far from white and it's got a subtle little pink gray tone to it. When I come up and make a mark onto my white section, it magically looks much darker. All of a sudden it becomes a mid-value in relationship to the white paper. When I make that same mark on the black, they don't even look like the same pastel stick anymore. Now all of a sudden it appears to my vision and everybody's going to be looking at your paintings. See, we could say, but that's the right stick for what I'm doing. But it, here its appearance is much lighter. Here its appearance is much darker. The stick didn't change. Its relationship in my palette didn't change. But its appearance here greatly changed. And then we'll just go ahead and make some marks over here. Again, this becomes more subtle. But we should maybe see a little bit of a cooling action and a warming action here. So let me make some marks with even some other sticks. You know, here we've got even a lighter stick. Here it almost looks pure white. See, many of us would think, Jesus, that artist used a pure white stick, and yet they didn't. They may have just placed it against something that was much darker. Let's make a few marks with some colors now. Let's take a violet. Can't go wrong with violet. Perfect, perfect color in landscape painting used so much for atmospheric tones. But what I can see right here in looking at it, I can see the value shift. That one's becoming pretty simple for all of us to see. Wow, there is a big effect when we hop, hop around on values with what we're using. So what appears to be a mid-value can appear much lighter and darker. But here we start to see that shift. On the warm tone, that looks considerably bluer. And over here, I start getting a tendency of a rosiness coming through. So if I use this on top of a sky that I may have underpainted with blue, I'm going to get a rosy glow. If I place this tone on top of some burnt grass that's in a field, all of a sudden I'm getting a blue-violet tone. A little darker version of violet. Dark shadow in this area. Nice mid-tone light in this area. And again, there should be a little bit of warming and cooling happening in this area. Just a little mark with red, just so that we can see the effect. And you can do this at home. I really encourage you to not always just focus on a painting. That's a big mistake. We make the painting so precious that we really don't learn the lessons that we need to digest to become really good intuitive painters. We have to digest information to become really good in making those decisions. People often say, how did you know to do that? They, you know, watch me do a demonstration. Or I watched some of the other great pastel gods that happen to be out there and painting gods that I admire. And I'll say, how did they just know to do that, to put that together? And when you ask them, as Monet was asked one day, Mr. Monet, tell me, what are you, what are you thinking as you're painting this painting? And he looked at the inquirer and he said, I'm not thinking, I'm seeing and I'm responding. And we have to digest and internalize this information. And then it really is intuitive. Painting is really intuitive. We learn our lessons, we digest that, we shut this part off at a certain point, and we paint and we respond. And we don't second guess that gut when the gut says, I think I want to make that area dark underneath or light underneath, or I want to put a warm tone under my sky so that when I put blue marks over the top, I get that effect, see? These choices, which are based in simultaneous contrast, come to you through experimentation. So I really encourage you with this process to get good at setting yourself up 
to do good underpaintings and to finish your paintings well, to experiment with arbitrary marks and things that aren't precious. Your precious painting you're afraid of ruining. These I don't care about. So I get to see the effect. Now I have a stronger sense of, you know what? This may be just fine in my trees as a wonderful highlight. What's a highlight in one area is a shadow in another. What's warm in one area is cool in another. It all comes back to simultaneous contrast. So remember that pastel can be done on a surface just by placing the marks onto the surface. And I'm going to place another mark of the same color here and affect it in a minute and the same thing here. And I'm going to leave the watercolor and the oil section right now open. And I'm just going to do this with a few basic color choices that, that represent the, the three basics. Okay, we've got yellow, of course red, and we're going to put a little blue down here as well. This is arbitrary for the sake of just this, this uh, demonstration right now, but it's just a means to show you how the different products look, again, without right now focusing on the subject, that precious painting that you want to paint. So I encourage you, be playful. Find out what the possibilities are before you commit to that really precious painting and then you get bogged down in being fear-based. This is a, a good paper towel. Try to get a good lint-free one. You can actually use a rag if you wish, but I'm just going to take some of the pastel on the gritty surface and spread it. And you can see that you can get a really nice dusty appearance. You can spread that pigment into the surface and get this kind of dreamy, ethereal look. So really beautiful underpaintings could be created by just placing pastel and then spreading it around and letting the lightness of the paper work for you. Uh, we're not using anything wet, but we're getting a similar thing of color coming through in the surface. And we can again get that nice dreamy ethereal. I've done a lot of work this way. I know I have a reputation for this wet, slippy, slidey underpainting stuff, but this is still one of my old mainstays. And you don't need anything but your pastels to be able to do that. Don't put too much pastel on when you work in this method. Keep it thin. B apply a little bit of pastel. Go with stronger, clear colors and avoid a lot of pastel choices that have white or a lot of black already added to them, which is part of what we have in our pastel palette. Because when I spread it and I get some of that light paper coming through, if I have a lot of white in my pastel and it mixes together, it becomes cloudy and chalky looking. And that's something that all pastelists have resisted. We've had a hard enough time getting a reputation as serious, legitimate painters instead of just delicate pastelists. What we also don't want is that chalky look, that milk of magnesia look in our work. So avoid those tones that have a lot of white or a lot of black in them. Okay? Now let's just take some water and see what happens when I take those same pastels. Again, not very thick. I haven't filled the tooth of what's here and I'm just going to use a brush that, that is actually an oil painter's brush. I prefer for this pro process, because the surfaces that I'm working on are textured, they tend to chew up delicate brushes. So even though I'm going to use water and watercolor here in just a minute, avoid watercolor brushes. They don't have enough body and strength for this process. And that can be one of the things that uh, may be impeding what your underpainting can do for you. So this is oil painting brushes. Good bristles will work. But natural haired bristle brushes tend to break off and flake because they're real hair. These are synthetic. This is nylon based brushes. Look for brushes that are sold as acrylic oil based brushes. And those will work really well for you and stand up to the brutality of the sanded surface. So let's just wet the yellow right now. And you can see how beautifully the pastel picks up the water. And then I'll bring it right down into the red and pick the red up into it. Very wet. A lot of fluid. And here I'm going to blot my brush a little bit so I don't completely dilute the blue as it migrates down. And just let these colors mingle here for a minute. Play with a little bit of the water. And you can see that I get the appearance, basically, of watercolor. That 
What I'm doing is utilizing a light surface, just like a watercolorist does, to get transparency and translucency. And we're using our pastel. Pastel is pure pigment in a stick form. Watercolor is pure pigment with a little gum in it to hold it down onto its palette. But what are you doing? You're picking up this down here with a brush and water and applying it to the surface. And over there, we were using, here we got just a little resist on this surface. So I'm going to rub that just a little bit, get rid of that. There we go. So you can see that it mingles together, similar. I'm not trying to get exactly the same look. I haven't even chosen the same pigments necessarily, but I just want to show you that we can make pastel appear very similar to what watercolor can do for us on our surfaces because it's really the water. When we talk about the mediums we're painting with, it's not so much that oil paint is different than watercolor in pigment or pastel in pigment, it's the vehicle that it's applied with. Uh, so pastel being pure pigment, when water is applied to it, it really in essence becomes watercolor. It's another method of watercolor. Here I'm choosing to just use watercolor. And since I really work a lot and plein air. I work a lot on location. It's a passion of mine and it feeds my studio work for me and I'll do it as long as I can and spend as much time out doing it as possible. To expedite the process, I really like having a small watercolor palette that I can quickly pop open, do a sketch on my surface, pop my palette open and zip into a brush with water and put the pigment on, put that away and go into my pastels. But I can get a very similar effect if I chose very wisely uh, choosing pastels to place onto the surface and spread with water. It's just that this takes a little more time. So for the sake of economy and to expedite the process, I usually choose to use watercolor on location. Now out, when I go outside, I use the watercolor like I said, but when I work indoors, I often choose to work with oil. So here I'm just showing you a, a, again a travel palette. This is just some aluminum foil with some basic oil colors squirted out onto it. That I can fold onto itself and easily put into a Ziploc bag when I'm traveling and that gives me the ability to travel lightly with oil and economically with oil. In my studio I use an oil palette for this process and the two things led to me figuring out that I could do this. One, I've always been an oil painter. As long as I've worked in pastel, I've worked in oil. I see the two as kindred spirits, so I've been familiar with it and often worked with my oil in very thin washes to begin my oil paintings. And one day I was painting in my studio and I was a little frustrated with the painting that was there and I took a break and I went over and I was reading some of the literature that happened to come with the Kitty Wallace paper. And in there she said that uh, the paper was of archival quality and could even accept an oil sort of painting and I thought, well, why would you want to do an oil painting on Kitty Wallace paper when you can work on linen, which is so fabulous? But it got me to thinking that if the paper would accept it, then I had the possibilities of what would it look like. So let's see what it would look like. If I take basic thinner, and again, this is a really good grade of thinner, and another one of these nice brushes, and I just pick up the pastel, like I did with the water earlier, and I can migrate and see, look, beautifully. Mineral spirits in pastel are friends just as much as water in pastel are friends. This evaporates as quick as water, if not quicker in some situations. And you're going to notice a dry down here at, when it's wet. I need to mention this because you're going to see it right now. Look how much richer the color appears. When I work over here, we'll give this a chance to dry down just a little bit and you're going to see a real noticeable change. But you can already see the difference in personality and character. See where the water-based, there's a blooming and a swelling that comes with water by nature. But thinner having such less density built into it, there's no swelling and as it drifts the pigment, we get these finer little pieces, what I call